right. So a few words about me very fast. So I'm in IT for around seven years now. And for the last two to three years, I was very lucky and got to play around with that new tech called cloud as a cloud architect. I was the team viewer and Daimler. So in the yeah, team viewer, probably well, very well known in the IT industry. Yeah, and I got to play with the two big cloud providers, Amazon Web Services and Google. And also in my last project, I was very lucky to do some of the cool new machine learning stuff with TensorFlow. So that were really cool projects I could work on. Yeah, and now I'm a cloud architect as well at Anexia. However, now I'm building a cloud platform, and that's kind of interesting to me. So at all three companies, I was basically cloud architect. But in the first two, it meant that I'm building something on top of existing clouds. And now at Anexia, it really means that I'm getting to build a cloud itself, which is, yeah, a cool, interesting change for me. OK, so a few words about Anexia, what we do. So I'll go over that like really fast. So we'll do software development, like web, mobile, and also some individual solutions. Then hosting and IT solutions, like yeah, we have over 80 data centers worldwide, which we can provide. And then for the last few years, we really tapped into the whole yeah, cloud market with infrastructure, platform, and service uh, software as a service. For example, CloudLog, which will be partly the topic of the workshop itself. Yeah, and then also other cool stuff. For example, our European Backbone, which is a project by our network team. So our Backbone is basically a private network connection which spans entire Europe. It's linked to all the major yeah, internet providers across Europe and gives us some options like advanced DDoS protection, stuff like that. So that's yeah, really cool project by our network guys. Yeah, some of the technology we're using. So a lot of development is now happening in Go. I've put up the old Go logo there because I really don't like the new one. I mean, the guy is so cute and the other logo is just boring in my opinion, but whatever. Then also like big data technologies like Elasticsearch and Kafka, which CloudLog is based on and we'll hear later from Michael about. Yeah, and then of course a big topic for us, or basically probably for all of you guys as well, Docker and Kubernetes of course. And yeah, we're also trying to be very, very active on GitHub. We have our own repo where we provide our own stuff, like for example, clients for our APIs or for CloudLog, and also we commit to existing other projects. Yeah, so we are, some facts about us, which can be interesting, an Austrian company, which can be important if you've been following up on the development in the last one, two years with big cloud providers and data security and all that stuff, can be a big topic. Then really important for us, we're not a startup, we're over 10 years old by now, and yeah, we're privately owned, which is important for us because it enables us to focus on stuff like technology and customers and put them in the middle and we're not really money focused. I mean, of course, we're a company and have to make some money, but money making is not our primary goal, which is really good for us developers. Yeah, then we're, well, I'll put Agile on top of that. I mean, everybody understands something different when we talk about Agile, but we kind of understand that we're Really, we have really fast development cycles, so usually our projects are done within days or weeks, and well, sometimes a few months, but the most projects are really done within a few days. And yeah, we achieved that by, well, we have a really high throughput rate, we think, and do that by having a fast decision process and short communication ways, which really means we try to get rid of yeah, like all the non-productive parts of the job and really focus on what matters, building great software and shipping that fast. Yeah, and also we're massively understaffed and of course always looking for new people. Yeah, some of the challenges we have to deal with. So first, growth. Well, growth is not really a challenge, it's great. So we have a growing customer base and increasing demands. However, with that comes the problem of scale. So Right at the moment, we have tens of thousands of servers running worldwide, spread across around 80 data centers. There's another stuff on top of that, like domains, DNS, a lot of storage, which we'll hear later from the storage guy. Yeah, so that's a lot of stuff to handle. Also, with the increasing customers and demands, a lot, the manual tasks are growing a lot. I mean, with every customer, 
you, you have a lot of more tasks and tickets to process, which can be really, or is really slow and expensive and also error prone. I mean, it turns out humans are not really good at doing repetitive stuff all the time. So our approach to all of that is, of course, automation. So we really try to automate like every manual task which is going on away. And yeah, our main tool for that is our Annexia engine, which builds on top of all our existing infrastructure yeah, and it provides yeah, an automation process around that. So yeah, since I've introduced that, the Annexia engine, which is, we call it our next gen cloud management platform. Yeah, and it's, you can see as example, it's this dashboard when you enter the console, it enables our customers, yeah, to see, for example, all the servers at a glance and get an overview, stuff like that. So, and the goal really here is to have a customer self-service portal, which means no more tickets, basically. Every time a customer has to write a ticket, it basically means we haven't done enough automation yet, right? So, for example, the customers can see all the VMs they have provisioned within our data centers and get the option, for example, via a nice UI to provision a new server within like two minutes worldwide, basically, or via the APIs we provide. Yeah, and at the core, it enables speed. It enables speed for us, for the customers, and, well, everyone is happy after that, I hope. It scales. Having more customers doesn't mean, well, it simply means we can add as many customers as we want since the system will just scale with it. It enables all the automation customers expect these days, so they want to integrate with their own solutions like maybe a Jenkins or stuff like that, and since we're providing the APIs around it, that's easily possible. Yeah, and also, of course, new possibilities like putting uh, PaaS and SaaS applications on top of that, like CloudLock, which we'll hear later about. Um, yeah, and for example, here's a screenshot of how a cloud log dashboard can look like. Okay. So I want to give you a short live demo of the console, uh, of the engine, and then we'll jump right away into the workshop part. And as I said earlier, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them also right now. Okay, so I'm in the dashboard part of the engine. That's basically when you first log in, you get a dashboard like this which is really neat. You can customize it all you want. For example, for me, I have some, in that demo account, I have some quick links in the top. I have an overview of one of my servers, which I'm interested in, and easily see like what the server is doing at the moment, basically nothing. And for example, I've got that server map where I see that I have a bunch of servers well, here in Austria, in Vienna. You can see them, so stuff like that. or as I said earlier, an easy provisioning process for VMs, for example, so yeah, should be big enough. So really within like two minutes, I can get a production ready VM covered by all the typical SLAs that you've yeah, agreed upon. So I can choose a data center, like since we're in Vienna, let's go with that. I can choose from an, from an operating system, like for example, Debian, can well, I'll have to specify the specs. I can go up to, oops, up to 64 gig of RAM and up to 16 cores, but we also provide other options which you can contact us for and then we'll, well, well, we'll enable it for you. But the default is 60 cores. Of course, I can also scale the storage as I want. Well, let's take a few, yeah. And, well, that's basically it. I have, of course, give the name a server, like the, Demo. Um, I have to provide either a password for the admin account or, of course, provide an SSH key. And yeah, that's basically it. And within the next two minutes, I will have a production ready VM up and running. Okay. Um, yeah. Any questions so far? Or else we can also watch this progress bar for the next two minutes. All right. So now I'm not going to make you watch that. Okay, so since we have no questions at the moment, let's jump over to the workshop part, remote application logging and analysis. Okay, so when we talk about that, what we really mean is observability, right? So I guess I didn't ask who of you are developers and who's like, please raise your hand, who is a developer? 
Okay, pretty much everyone. So I guess you're kind of familiar with the concepts of logging, but let's talk about it for a minute and then jump right into the technical demo. So yeah, as you probably all know, observability really crucial part of your systems when they run in production. I mean, if you develop locally, it's easy. You can sh just attach your debugger to everything and that's great. But if you have systems running in production, you really need stuff like logs and metrics to tell you how your system behaves. Usually not the best idea to yeah, have a debugger running in your production system at all time. Yeah, and really at the core, the, they enable two things, insights and actions. So the logs and metrics will tell you what's going on in your systems, and then you can act upon that. Like typical cases that you don't even recognize that your website is going down and your customers are angrily calling your sales team or something like that, so that shouldn't really happen. Yeah, and basically, observability, it's composed of those three components, logs, metrics, and traces. Okay, so it's getting more and more complicated from our experience. So the old world, it was really easy. You had your users either coming usually from a desktop application or from a web browser. You usually, like 10, 15 years ago, you had your one server running your backend, and that's kind of it. And usually your single database like MySQL. And yeah, the logging world was easy back then, right? You had basically, you as a developer, you were maybe responsible for the backend. Usually the storage was covered by some DBA. And if something went wrong, you had to look on the logs of that one backend and yeah, easy world basically. Nowadays, the new world is looking a lot more complex. Your users are coming from all sorts of devices and we have still the desktop and mobile stuff, uh, desktop and websites. But now we also have a lot of traffic, like 50% or more coming from mobile devices. And then also that new stuff called IoT, which is going on, where a lot of traffic is coming from. Yeah, in the backend, it's getting more and more complex. I mean, you still you don't have that one server anymore. Usually services are spread at least across three or more servers. And also, if you're already doing that new microservice stuff, well, you have a lot of different services going on, all of them generating logs. Yeah, and in the backend, there's really also that move away from your one single database, right? You have no SQL databases, a lot of different ones. Yeah, stuff like that. So it's getting more and more complex. Yeah, and at the core, what you really want or how you want to approach all of that is by a concept called unified logs, where you put all the logs from your dis different applications, databases in one central place. So you have the uh, option to put dashboards on top of that, search through those logs, alert on those logs, all that stuff. Yeah, and some factors that you want to consider, you want to have that in real time. I mean, you don't want to wait 10, 15 minutes for your logs to be available usually. You want to have that well, ideally within seconds. You want to have easy access to that. I mean, I guess all of you have done the typical game that you have to SSH into 10 different servers and check everyone for the logs, stuff like that. So not really a pleasant experience, right? I mean, I've done that for like five years, I think, scrambling through Windows Server logs. Uh, don't want to do that anymore. Um, yeah, and also, if you do that, going like SSH into one server, you see the log from one server and that's it. You don't get an entire picture. If you have all the logs within one place, that really enables you yeah, to see the entire picture. And at the, yeah, at the root, why we do this, we want a faster root cause analysis. So if something goes wrong, if we want to see what, what's happening with our system, we don't want to spend one hour jumping through different servers and whatever. We see that we want to ask a question and get the answer right away, right? Okay, so our approach to all of that is a service called CloudLog, which is a part of our engine. And I'm going to talk for a few minutes about what features CloudLog provides. However, this is really not limited to CloudLog itself. That basically goes for every logging solution that you either use from another provider that you spin up yourself or even build yourself, whatever. So these, yeah, these components are, I'm going to talk about are really, that's something you should be in the lookout for, yeah, for your solutions. They should cover that. So since it's a it's a managed service by us, it's for you. It's zero administration. We take care of all of that. It's an instant setup. So I'll show that later. Within two minutes, it's up and running for you within a fresh account, and it scales on demand. So you don't have to worry about that. You can basically send as many logs as you want, and we'll take care of the scale. You of course have to pay for that, but you don't have to worry about the scale. All right, so features, basically, 
We should all provide all the features that observability is composed of, so logs, metrics, traces, and then ideally, of course, alerts as well, since you don't want to sit there all day and watch the dashboards. If something goes wrong, you won't really want to get an alert by email, SMS, Slack, something like that. Then dashboards, you want to, of course, have the option to put a dashboard on top of all of that, since the times of just looking at plain text logs are over. For us, we built our dashboard our own within the engine, but we also integrate with Kibana and Grafana, which are two of the most commonly used dashboards these days, both open source, great tools. And then we also, since under the hood, CloudLog is based on Elasticsearch, basically everything which is Elasticsearch compatible will also work with CloudLog. And that's, yeah, something we, if you're evaluating a new logging solution, it's something you should also yeah, look after that you have the option to integrate with like Kibana or Grafana or so and don't have to put that yeah, vendor-specific dashboard on top of it, then you're really starting to lock yourself in. Then fast, as I said earlier, you don't want to wait 10 or 15 minutes for your logs to arrive within your system. So for us, that was really a key topic in CloudLog, and we managed to get the ingestion time to usually below five seconds. So from the moment an event happens until it's available within the dashboards, it's below five seconds most of the time. And then we also have a live viewer, if you like, can't wait at all, that then it's usually available below one second. Yeah, and for us, it was really important to have all of that based on open source technology. So at the core, we're using Elasticsearch and Kafka. And then we also integrate with all common logging libraries, for example, for Go, Logras, which is one of the most used logging frameworks. And then, for example, Open Census from Google, which covers all the traces, metrics, that stuff. Okay, so now going over to the demo part, where I show you a little bit of cloud log. Okay, so within our Nexia engine, it's based on the big data, and then we have the cloud log part, where I already have one index running, which I prepared for today, called VAD demo. We have the option for our own dashboards, as I said earlier, the option to create alerts. So, yeah, also basically what I wanted to talk about earlier. So you can create an alert on top of existing metrics and then push it to something like, for example, email, SMS, HipChat, all the typical stuff. And that's also really one of the key components that you want to have the option to, to get those notifications. Okay. So within the index, if we jump to that, you get a short overview of like the most important metrics of your index, like the amount of documents I have in there, amount of storage, stuff like that. You get a little preview of the last few events that arrived. Then you can either jump into the data viewer we built our own, the live viewer, which I can show later. And then, as I said, we integrate very nicely with Kibana and Grafana. And you also don't have to host it yourself. It's, it's part of the engine we provide. So you can just click on the Kibana link and you'll be redirected to a Kibana instance that we host. You're pre-authenticated so you don't have to log in again. Yeah, and you basically have a really default Kibana, which if you've been playing around with Kibana, you, you'll instantly know and you have to, don't have to learn any new query language or whatever. You can just use it out of the box. Okay, so now I want to show you just for a few minutes how we tackle each of those three topics I talked about, so logs, metrics, and traces within CloudLog. So logs, I mean, all of your developers, you probably know what a log is, so can go over that really quickly. Record of the wind, so you usually write it with something like log.info also. It's usually per action, so every time something happens, you write a log entry and should ideally write down what's happening. So the first example is like a really bad example of a log entry. I mean, you don't know what's really going on. The one below is a bit better. I know at least which file gets downloaded. Yeah, you have different logs level, I mean, I hope. So like info, one error, stuff like that. Yeah, and also it can, I mean, it's not like it's rocket science, but it can get tricky. I mean, there was a company which that happened to lately, so 
Yeah, don't put passwords in the logs, right? Okay, so I've prepared a little demo setup for today. Um, yeah, we have a front end, which is a little iOS app written in Flutter, which is really cool. So as a preparation of that workshop, I got to play around with Flutter for one day. If you don't know that, that's a uh, mobile SDK for iOS and Android by Google. So with a single code base, it enables you to write uh, yeah, for iOS and Android, like probably a hundred other frameworks out there as well. But it's from Google, so yeah. Uh, in the back end, we have three simple services written in Go, which are running on three of our servers within our test account for the, in the engine. So we we'll, can see those servers later. And then as a storage tier, we don't use a database. We we'll talk, those microservices talk to the, to the engine API and just queries VM information. So within the app, I'm basically showing the same information we've seen earlier within the, yeah, within the engine dashboard. Okay, so log management. So that's, that's the app, nothing fancy. As I said, I just played around with that for one day, got to know the framework a little bit. It's, yeah, just basically lists all the VMs we have running within our system. So it's five of them and seems like one of them is down at the moment, kinda happens. And I can click on all, one of those and get an detail information if the Wi-Fi is working. Now, okay, yeah, basic stuff like CPO load and all of that. And yeah, as you can see, it's it's five VMs. And basically, if I go into the engine, I'll see those five servers as well. So, just querying our API, which provides you with the same information that you can see within the dashboard itself. Yeah, and within CloudLog, I mean, nothing too fancy. It's, I can either query it or see some information about the logs that just arrived in our preview. So it's 8.27, which should be correct. I mean, that's UTC time, so fits. And of course, I have the option to see that instantly within Kibana or Grafana as well. If I refresh here, yeah, we see that uh, those are the logs I just created. Um, since I talked about it earlier, the, the live viewer, which can be interesting, so to see how fast it can really be. So if I go into the live viewer and start it, so let's create some events. And as you can see, the logs already arrived in there. So it really takes usually below one second to be available within that live viewer. And if we check, for example, Kibana now, it, the logs should already be in there as well. Yeah, new events there. And yeah, we really found out that it's key to have those fast ingestion time. I mean, you don't have to have it below one second or five seconds, I mean like 10, 15, even 30 seconds is still okay, but you really don't want to sit there and wait like 10, 15 minutes for your logs to arrive. Okay, so that's it for logs. Yeah, so metrics, kind of same deal basically, but the big difference to logs is that metrics, they're usually a time series and, and right with an aggregated view, so you don't want to go down to each event level just really want to know what's going on in my system as an overview. So how many requests do we have? How many requests per this API call do we have? What's the error rate? Stuff like that. And the nice thing is basically it works exactly the same. You still can write your log entries, um, just the same as for logs. And then the only difference is basically how you approach it in the, in the dashboards itself. So a really nice example for that is Grafana, which is really built for those time series metrics. And yeah, what I'm doing here, I've built a little demo within Grafana, which just shows us our total API call rate from some events I created yesterday. And for example, split per, per methods. So 
Uh, there's some list and then detail API. So the list API is where you just get the overview of the five VMs running and the detail where we get yeah, the details about CPU and stuff. And then it's also very easy to, for example, split them on a per server base. So I know exactly which of my three backends is, is receiving how many requests and yeah, can tackle some issues there, for example. And well, I mean, it, the way to approach that is basically, as I said, the same way I, we, you can approach normal logs and just by adding a few more meta fields. So if we look at one of the log entries, we have stuff like, of course, the time, the log info, what happened, and then you just put in some more additional fields like the source host or the API which was called, and then you can, with, with the interface in Grafana, for example, you can build the curves easily on, based on the same data. Okay, and the third thing, traces. So tracing, basically traces are kind of combination of logs and metrics, but really, yeah, built for our newer, yeah, microservice world. So let's take the example that you start from your mobile app and you issue some request. It hits some backend, and then this backend will usually hit at least his own database. And if you're really in that microservice world, two, three other backends maybe, and those backends can easily fan out to another, another backends. I mean, it's really common for one call at the front from, from your front end to have like 20, 20, 30 API calls in the backends. And yeah, that gets really complicated real fast. So imagine like an error is happening here. You wanna see like the entire chain of what's going on, right? You just don't wanna look at the logs of this one server and yeah then you may be really missing out on some context. So what you want to have, or the option you want to have is that you take the logs for that event from this one server and search for the whole picture. And one really easy way actually to approach that is by something called correlation IDs, um, which you can either build yourself through all the systems, but you really shouldn't. There are good frameworks out there like Open Census, which I mentioned earlier, which takes care of all of that. But what all those frameworks basically, basically do is they generate a unique ID at the very start of the request, and then it just gets passed down through all the requests or through all the services. And then you can just search for that unique request ID and you'll get, yeah, basically the entire picture. I've prepared a little demo for that as well. Again, so. Okay, so let me clear that. So if I restart the app, it will do a new list command. And then to make it a bit easier for today. And of course it hang in the live demo as usual. Okay, I have to attach the debugger again, I guess. One second. Okay, now it started again, and to make it easier, I've just printing out the correlation ID, and then I can take this ID, jump into, for example, Kibana, and filter for that one ID, and hope it works. Yeah. Okay, and now I easily see, I mean, in this case, I only have a front end and back end, so, but it would work exactly the same if I had like 30, 50 back ends. I see the logs coming from the front end, from the back end, and yeah, can see all of that. Yeah, I basically get the entire picture. Okay. Any questions so far? Else we'll jump over to Michael, who's going to do a technical deep dive on like, yeah the technology we're using. Yes? Mm 
Okay, yeah. Um, so we have that yeah, error dialog which will pop up where you have to choose you know, the name for your alert. Um, then the index you want to alert on, so that's the one for today. The query, so that's if you know Elasticsearch, basically your Lucene query you have to write, so you get the data from. Uh, the check interval, so how often should we run this check? And then some conditions like, um, yeah, if you had above 10 errors in the last five minutes, for example, then send me a note, stuff like that. And then you have that action dialogue um, where you can, for example, choose the severity. So if it's maybe you want to also just know if your traffic a bit drops, so you wouldn't send that with a high priority and wake up people at the night. So you always only send that with low, for example. And then, of course, important, the, the alert type. And there we integrate with, yeah, the usual stuff, email, SMS, webhook, and of course, some other tools like Slack, HipChat, uh, yeah, PagerDuty, for example, which is one of the common tools. Yeah, and that's basically it. We'll be running that stuff in the background and yeah, alert you if something happens. Hello again, I'm Michael Rauter, um, solution architect at Annexia. Uh, so I give you a short introduction to myself. Um, I was basically a full stack developer for years. And then the last years I changed to the platform solutions team at Anexia, which um, is our internal and where we design and develop internal and external solutions and services and cloud services. Um, I'm not the speaker guy, so sorry if it's not so fluent. Um, <laughs> so I want uh, to take a technical look behind the uh, uh, example cloud service uh, of cloud log or about application logging. Um, so basically the way from the idea to the technical implementation and the uh, final um, cloud service. So what we have learned most um, is, is when we have defined the goals and the requirements of the product is the technical research. For example, for this product, we put months into the research um, to get the right architecture, which, which meets all our requirements. And so we tried out many technologies and, and solutions and often throw the whole architecture away and try a new approach. And this multiple times until we had the, the right, or we think we had the right um, architecture. Um, and then the next minutes, I want to share our experience in this journey. Um, Yes, and our lessons learned. Um, a quick overview about the goals and challenges of this service. Um, on the left side, we basically have all our clients and data sources, which could be basically anything which generates event data. So, for example, um, then there is application logs, but also system metrics or if we talk about network devices, um, network flows from routers, or even business data, or you can also ingest a Twitter stream. You can be creative. It could be anything which is an event, basically. Um, on the right side, we need a storage system which basically um, provides a searchable, uh, a searchable index and also APIs to do analytics stuff like aggregation, calculations, and visualization tools. And the most interesting part is in the middle. This is where all the, the magic is, is happening. Um, there we have multiple requirements. So the, um, on the input side, there could be a large amount of data and we can't control it. So clients could go crazy and send thousands of logs uh, in one second. And so it must, must be managed that a big peak on this side um, cannot influence our the layer behind. So uh, one of the important thing is the decoupling of the, the input side and the storage and serving side. Um, of course, in this um, 
will a section or the raw data must be proceed and structured as we defined in the in our data model or processing model because we get raw logs uh, in and want structured objects in our search index to 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 be able to analyze it um, of course multiple protocols must be supported could be syslog for example http or simple tcp flows um, so also multiple protocols must be um, supported on the input side of course uh, as we are talking about the cloud service things like securities acrs and traffic quotas are important things so um, all this stuff must be um, provided by this by this middle layer and um, there are also some other um, general challenges when you want to deploy a cloud service in production um, here's a short a short um, overview of it with four points first is scalability um, in our log service it must be or it doesn't matter if we have one event per second or one million so scalability is the most important one of the most important things the cloud service every part of your um, architecture must be able to scale so only if one one part is not um, yeah, scalable you have a problem and, and it could break your whole architecture the same is true for the high availability so you always have to um, could always could happen if a hardware software um, you have hardware software outage or network connection interruption so your architecture must be designed that nodes or connectivities can fall out and your service doesn't break um, reliability which means for example in terms of data consistency um, um, defines the scope which storage layer or processing layer you choose and also as i said about security and quotas and you have a multi-tenant system um, because one the actions of one customer or one user shouldn't influence the another customer or even worse the whole system um, the last point maintainability um, of course it's easier for you if you choose solutions or or software where you had a great community or even commercial support behind you and of course upgrade scenarios are the important thing you cannot pull down your whole cluster for a small security update so it must be able to do rolling upgrades and stuff like that and one very important point are the metrics collect everything what's going on in the system so you know what's happening and you also need these metrics if you have a commercial service for doing stuff like billing and so on and now we investigate the right um, solution or base for our product so we investigate many different um, solutions or open source projects in this area and and find the right architecture to fit all our re requirements or to meet all our requirements so we tried a lot uh, like old stuff batch processing with Hadoop and the environment Cassandra different processing frameworks like Flink Spark you maybe know this all these things and in the end because um, we're talking about mostly about application logs and these are text-based logs where we need features like full text, full text search and and so on um, we decided to take a closer look um, on the elastic stack um, of course we also um, tested other things but most databases like profit or prometheus are basically for numeric metrics and not for uh, text text uh, logs so we take a closer look um, on the elastic stack and, and now i want to uh, go through different approaches and why they don't, don't fit and yeah but what we do in the end 
Okay, um, so you didn't know these technologies a lot. Short introduction, the Elastic Stack basically consists of clients on the um, server or client side, which ships the logs through and uh, uh, there are different pipelines, either directly in Elasticsearch, which is a database system, a scalable database system with uh, based on bachelor science. So it gives you also a search index. And Logstash is a processing pipeline in between where you can parse or transform your logs as you need it. And that's a typical um, stack for application logs. And it's easy to set up um, it's ready for many log types. So Logstash has integrated transformation tools where can your web server or database logs um, in a structured format and can index it in Elastic. And it's widely used and very popular. But for our service, um, we have some limitation. Um, it's not that good scalable. And for, um, the most important thing, you can control uh, the, exactly the flow and the input flow and the output flow in this processing layer. And also, and we cannot add um, security layers or uh, write management in it. So, and also the, the processing and buffering is limited to the available plugins to Logstash. So we that um, investigate further. Next approach was um, to get a message queue between the clients and our system to have a buffer so that uh, yes, peaks in, on the client side cannot influence the underlying system. But now we had a standardized and scalable input interface, but um, had again the limited processing capabilities of Logstash and also have a more complex architecture. And in our tests, Logstash is, in our opinion, very bad in case of memory usage. So, and fine, sorry. So the final approach was to eliminate uh, the Logstash part and replace it completely with the Kafka environment. In this case, Kafka as a message broker, which acts as a queue between client and the storage layer. And we use Kafka streams for the whole processing thing to get the structured data out of the raw data. Um, now we fitted all our requirements, which I mentioned before, which uh, basically means um, we have a scalable input and output interface. We have um, we can also use um, different stream processing frameworks, uh, for example, also Spark or Storm or something like that. If they do some machine learning or whatever, and Kafka also provides things like a secure uh, transport layer, ECLs, and coders. So. Only uh, the only thing we had to do is to write our stream processors. Um, basically, the stream processor and Kafka streams, where the user can define how the, the raw input data will be transformed into a structured data. Yes, and <laughs> our final architecture, maybe a little mess, but I will try to explain. Um, again, we have the client side where all the logs and event data is coming from. Um, we get ingest data, all goes through our brand network and proxy layer, load balancers, and so on. And um, when we when the client actually use the Kafka output sync, it's directly connected and uh, secure to our Kafka cluster. But we also support different protocols like if you ingest with HTTP, syslog. It goes through our data API, which is basically then the translator for the protocol to Kafka. And, and all the raw data then uh, lands in the Kafka. And here the stream processing is running, which parses or transforms, aggregates the data as, as um, defined in the pipeline by the user, and then will be indexed in Elastic. And when it's in Elastic, it could be uh, queried and 
anal analyzed via the query API in, in the engine or also in external or third party tools or even in your own applications. So the query API is um, compatible to the um, standard Elasticsearch API. So every app or every system which can talk to Elasticsearch can talk to our service. But you have a security layer in between. So yes. Um, on the management side, some uh, insights. We use, for example, a salt stack to deploy everything, control the, the whole services, the configuration. Um, so when we add nodes or even a new cluster of the service, just had to um, yes run uh, some commands and the cluster will be automatically deployed. And also in the background, inside the cluster, we, knew we have used um, tools from HashiCorp. Maybe you know it. Don't know console, Nomad. Um, console is a service discovery and health checking tool. It's internally used um, to know that the services know each other and, and what nodes are up and down. So we, um, Yes, we don't have to worry about internal connectivity problems. And Nomade is an orchestration tool, basically, where we can uh, manage our running stream processors, basically, because um, they are distributed over, over the whole cluster and, and dynamically as the input traffic, uh, as large as the input traffic is. So one pipeline where we have 10,000 of events per second needs more instances of, of the stream processors than one which have one event per second. And this is managed via Nomad. Um, and so um, as this error should be um, show, if you have your own application, a third party application, it always goes for our proxy um, because the, this uh, query, query API is a distributed um, Google microservice. And so the load balancer um, yes, chooses the node where you get the query and then the query API um, queries the, the data from the storage layer. Um, the management layer is only internal, so you, it's for our service. When you use it via the engine, you can create indexes and your pipelines. Let's, let's go through the management and API. But yeah, when you use the query API, it, it, um, every time it goes over the load balancers through the query API, and, and there is no direct connection to Elastic or, or Kafka in this case. Okay, now I would like come to a demo because we are developers and want to see some code and some terminal stuff. And for the for the demo, um, we choose to go through into more detail into Kafka because here is the most part happening and I think it's the interesting part of this whole architecture. And Until 
Can you point to me such a Um, so it's, as I said, it's still out of possible. Basically, to connect directly to Kafka, except that it's going through our proxy layer, which we have to do. But it's still basically 100% Kafka compatibility. Maybe to this topic, what I forget, um, the, the underlying layer, for example, our Kafka cluster or Elastic cluster, um, is also designed to be a base for other products, not only for cloud logs, so we have a processing layer here and and later, maybe later, um, also other products like Kafka as a service or Elastic as a service or higher level products like a managed data warehouse or something like that can be set up on this layer. So if you have time later, please explore and then we can talk about it. I'll send you Okay, for our demo, um, I choose a simple logs pipeline where we have a, a client which generates web server logs and normal system uh, logs via syslog. Um, we have a Kafka cluster with three nodes and the Elastic cluster behind with five nodes. Um, yes, as mentioned in the slide, um, the Beats agent collects the web server, uh, the batch log file, and ships it to a Kafka, we are the Kafka producer API, and the syslog just we just had to to add the, the remote syslog endpoint of our service to the rsyslog config, and it will be also shipped to Kafka. In Kafka, inside the Kafka, always we have an input and the output topic per pipeline. So in the input topic, we have the raw data inside, and the stream processing then, um, which is defined by the user. Um, yeah, transforms and passes it to a structured format, and then we use the connect API to connect our output topic of the pipeline with the according index in the Elasticsearch cluster. Okay, yeah, some words, for example, for the uh, connect API, it's a higher level um, API where I don't have to code. Um, there are multiple source and things connectors for this framework. For example, you can connect easily your data from other database systems or uh, queue systems, search, search systems, or even uh, like things like Twitter, um, only by a config file and connect your source and sync with Kafka. So here we don't need a, a, a code, just say put from this topic to this index in Elastic. Okay, um, at first I want to show the client side, just to ship blocks from the client to the Kafka node. So I hope everything is working. I had connectivity problems before, but yes, you will see. Um, I see a terminal on Q not. Yes. So I hope you can read this. Is this large enough? Um, yeah, in the first place, um, above you have the client, uh, on the left side, uh, the config of the syslog, you just need to add a forwarder. If you know R syslog, you can just um, add an endpoint um, and the port, and all your syslog messages of the system will be forwarded to the service. And on the right side, we have a simple Apache web server where we have the logs on this path. And we use the beats agent, the file bit agent, which basically um, harvests the file and chips all logs um, to the defined output. And in our case, um, because we are also compatible with the standard Kafka API, we just can use the existing Kafka output, just say our, end, our endpoint um, to some configurations. Um, we have, we use, um, TLS client authentication, you just have to uh, 
define your certificates and yeah that's it and and we start our agent and here are connected with the Kafka cluster the two topics it's the input topic of the um, syslog and that's the input topic of the of the web server and then I do some requests to the to our demo normally the file bit um, is defined you waited some seconds and you barely Oracle checks the file and then yes and then we have it on the broker side or you know maybe before the patch logs is going on on your web server so now we have a raw string of the data in the in the on the input topic on the Kafka cluster but our our goal is to have a structured version in, in one visualization tool like you see here so for example um, you also see the raw string here but through because it goes through the Kafka streams processing that uh, the uh, single fields will be passed out like the response code or host name um, yes and something like that and now of course the question is where we, how we come from the the raw message to the structured object in our index and now I want to dive into Kafka streams a little bit more with some test applications so we see how this whole thing um, works for that I give you a short introduction in Kafka streams yeah also a slide uh, about this for the talk about um, we have the raw string from our log file or from our log source and we want a structured object which can be searched and analyzed and yeah and we use uh, Kafka streams for that and basically the user in the front end can define so there's they don't have to write code can define it in the front end and you can say the pipeline of the processors in this example we have a pipeline of three processes in the first um, the so-called grok processor if you don't know it it's basically a simplified regular expression um, parser and their user can define yes the first um, the first word or first uh, yeah, thing is the IP address then comes the ident and auth object the timestamp the word the method and so on and, and then our streaming application passes it like that um, you see there are also additional information which doesn't exist in the input data so we also have stream processes for example for GOIP to add um, GOIP information um, out of the, of the client IP or also parsers for the user agent because if you had in this form instead of the of the original user agent format you can do better analytics and visualization stuff and because we have a general system the logs could be anything it, it could be a custom format and you can define it easily in the UI what ha should happen and it will be translated in the according Kafka streams um, application and then every log type can be parsed into a structured object and then you can search it and visualize, visualize it and do analytic stuff um, yeah short introduction Kafka streams it's a um, distributed stream processing um, library on top of, of Kafka um, can do stateful and stateless um, applications so we also can do long-term or aggregations over a time or a windowing and stuff like that and there are different layers on um, how you can implement your application um, on top there's the stream DSL the description language um, there you have predefined um, um, methods for aggregations or transformations it's very simple to use and you don't need much code but it's limited to this um, they have provided methods so there's also a lower level processor API where you can implement your custom processors and custom transformation 
and even things like your machine learning algorithms and so on, stuff like that. And there is a very new thing which just um, announced as production ready by a conference, uh, the company behind Kafka, which is KSQL. There you can even um, write your applications with SQL-like queries, so you don't have to code anything. You just make SQL queries and also can do um, simple processing apps. Um, now I want to make a short quick start of the Kafka streams. You just download the Confluent platform, which concludes all um, needed um, parts, Kafka and so on, and then you can um, start your application, forget it via Maven, um, like this command, you find it also in the quick start um, documentation. And yes, when we do this, sorry, technical problems. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just check out the project, the quick start project we are made. And now when I open it in IntelliJ, um, it's the wrong, the wrong window. Yes, the quick start um, consists of three examples, a simple pipe, which basically pipes the input topic to the output topic. Um, you always have the same configuration. You say your Kafka cluster co connection, um, you give it a name, and you just have to define your types of your input and output um, values and keys. In this case, we just working with strings, so we have the string for a key and the value. And this is an example for the higher level stream DSL. Um, I just have to say the the input topic and the output topic. Yeah, that's all to create a streaming program between two uh, topics in Kafka. Of course, there's no transformation between, so we have the second example, which is the same, but had uh, some transformation. So it's called line split, um, or we have strings input on the input topic, and there we see one of these predefined um, methods I mentioned. There are some more, like you can group your um, events by the key, or, or as the name said, flat it, so you get more events out of one event, or you even can join different streams from different sources. Um, there are a lot of, of predefined um, methods, which is mostly um, enough for your stream application. And in this example, it took the words from the input topic, split it up, and write every word as a single output um, event in the output topic. Um, a classical stream processing example is the word count, basically the same as the line split, but it also counts after flatten, um, it groups it by the key, or by the value, by the word, and counts it, and so we then get um, a counter per word. Yes, we want to see it in action, so. So. Prepared it here. Um, yeah, I have a producer on the input type topic and the consumer of the output of the pipe example. And here I've started just um, over Maven, over Maven the, the pipe class, which we saw before. And when I add something here, copy me, we will pipe to the output topic. Yes. 
Uh, the same is for the line split. Um, split me up. And here we say we have the flat map uh, method. So one event goes down to three events on the output topic. And yeah. So it's working. Yes. We have the split. And the same is for the word count. Um, I input some words. Oh, wrong window. Devs, no devs, or no devs. Then you see updated counts um, of the words. Of course, I tested it before. Uh, more the count is higher than than three or four, like what it should be. Yeah, and and of course, um, an example which is more about our logging parsing thing. Um, Go ahead, write a short example, parser. We also see the process uh, RP interface. In this case, we use the, we also have an input topic and the output topic and map our values, which is a simple transformer via the stream, DSL API. In this case, we just uppercase the string. And now we can also use the transform um, method which is a which um, accepts an interface to the processor API which is the low level processor in Kafka streams and so we can implement our own um, logic in this case because this example for uh, for the new Uperian, uh, yeah Uperian data protection regulation we have to anonymize anything and so there is a simple processor which anonymize um, IP addresses so I have a regex which basically replaces IP addresses that the last octet of an IP for four um, IP address with an X. Just simple to demonstrate. And I'm gonna start this. And I have again the producer on the input and the consumer on the output and the started application. And hello, I'm from this IP and then the streaming application uppercase it and then a my IP. And maybe now you can imagine how we could a pipeline like in the presentation where the user defines different processors which will be translated in Kafka Streams application and then the input topic um, goes through more or less complex logic and I get a structured format on the output topic. Of course, these are simple examples, but the main thing about Kafka Streams is that you can distribute this um, this application. You can throw it or over 100 nodes when you have millions of incoming records and uh, the stream application um, yeah, uh, distributes over the, the running instances. So you have a scalable processing capability capability. Um, I also want to show um, the the new thing, the KSQL, where you can you don't have to write um, your Java, Java or Scala application. Of course, there are um, interfaces also to other programming languages. Um, we do, as you heard, a lot with Go, so we also use Go to do our stream processing with Kafka. And but now I want to also show the the KSQL thing. Um, therefore. I have a UI where you can input the our queries, and we want to write we want to write an easy alerting application, which collects um, failed logins of our H, uh, SSH logins on our test client, and we want to get a Slack alert if there are many 
invalid logins from one IP. So here we go. This is a simple interface where I can input my queries. Um, I can show the topics and yes, I will zoom in. And now I can just you can just like SQL like a language. You can create a stream in this case, give it a name, say the according Kafka topic. This is the topic where our syslog um, comes, our bar syslog comes in, and the underlying data format is Arbor in this case, but it's out of scope. And then when we created the stream, it says okay, and then we can do a simple select on this new stream. So as you know it from normal databases, but we're talking about the continuous stream. So the result of the of the stream is also continuous. That, that's are the live events which comes in, and I don't have to write any line of code. I just can do selects on my continuous stream. And now we can also do more um, logic in it. For example, um, when we have uh, invalid SSH login, the, the coding syslog message is invalid user um, pop from this and that IP um, had a failed login. So we can also do things like, like were to filter things. So we get all um, invalid logins in a new stream, run that also, and now the interesting part with more logic inside the query, um, you, as, uh, there are streams and tables. Streams are the, the continuous streams. And tables are, so to say, uh, the current representation of a, of a stream because we have a continuous um, system, the current state every time is updated, but we can create a table which every time represents the current, current state. So we can do here a stateful application which makes a window over 30 seconds. Um, it gets the data from the invalid um, stream which we created and then groups it by the IP from the syslog message and um, make a count as the arrow count. So then we get a table which is grouped by the IP and we get the count of the invalid logins. So you, you had to write, for example, 20 lines of code when you make a stream processing app and here you can do it with a single query. And you could, can do um, yeah, simple real-time analytics and alerting stuff. With it. So we also create this table and then I have a last um, query which we use for our alerting system um, afterwards. It just um, creates a new topic where the alerts will be saved and then as you know it from SQL we put our um, alert message concurrent concatenate some fields, the IP, the current count, and, and some words. And we have the um, condition for every IP, which has more than five invalid logins, um, one entry should be created. So run. And now I can select on this table. Let it be first. Suck. And now Kafka Streams um, creates a real stream application um, above this SQL queries, which are running in the cluster. And now when I do some failed logins, suck. Mm, here. And after, yeah, I did five invalid logins, and so I get a new entry in this table, 
where I get from this IP, I have five um, invalid loggings in the last in the last thirty seconds. It's um, yeah, without any line of code, I, I did an alerting application or a alerting system to trigger alerts. And now I can, for example, connect a simple um, application on it with, um, in this case, it's Go. You don't have to worry about the language, but basically it also connects to the pro card to our created um, alert topic where the alerts will be triggered and just simple um, consumes it. And every time alerts come in, every time alerts come in, um, we send it to uh, our Slack API and triggers an alert in our Slack account. So just consume this alert topic and send events to Slack. And now if you start this also, it's the Go application, just, just start it. Now it consumes the alerting topic. And if I, sorry, if I do some, some failed logins again. And yes, the, the Kafka, the Go uh, alerting tool consumes it and sends a message out and I should get my Slack account. Yes, here it is. Then I get yeah, this IP, tried to log in on my server multiple times and failed. So yeah, and it's only an example for a notification, but as, as Marcos mentioned, there could be also a webhook behind, which automatically bans this IP from our service or something like that. So you see, it's very simple, also with the news, Kafka uh, SQL, to create streaming applications without to write much line or any line of code. Okay, um, yeah, I think um, we go through the, the main part of our stream processing layer. So yeah, to summarize it, um, we have to use Kafka and the round and the framework around Kafka, like Streams Connect, the uh, processor and consumer APIs to do all our processing stuff. And yeah, the end, some lesson, lessons learned. And I find the right slide here. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, what we learned is always, yeah, before your architecture or implement something with a bigger scale, put your energy in research, testing and benchmarking that you find the, the right um, architecture. Um, yeah, as I also said, metrics are a very important path, uh, thing to know what's going on and, and to find problems before it breaks your system. Um, the operation at scale is always different of course, when you test it, test, try to test it with production data. Um, yeah, otherwise, you mostly have a bad experience in when you go into production. And yes, keep also your architecture up to date. In this area, things are under, under heavy development. There are always new features in Kafka, Elastic, for example. And yes, also performance improvements and so on. And so it's. It's good to keep your architecture up to date and yes, basically that's it from my technical side. Um, if you have any questions about the architecture, please. Yeah, um, at the beginning, um, we tried different open source solutions, like different stacks, for example, from Influx Data or also Cassandra as, as a database system. And we have a test where we generate 
um, multiple locks, different types, different data types, and and different amounts. And we uh, put it through different pipelines from different solutions, and then compare it. But not we not only um, look at the performance and something like that, but also on the operational thing, how easy or how how um, yes how you can manage it and and for the maintenance stuff how upgrades look like and something like that and yes all this matrix um ingestion time processing time um query time of the storage layer every matrix we, we which makes sense for us um yeah and so we compare it and test it and then choose our right solution which we think fits best because I just consume that stuff that they get that those guys build so I don't take care about that so I use that as a service as you should or would I don't know um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what we do with this thing and what I abuse it for and not really do I don't really do just the logging part I do something something more and something else so a little bit about me um, at the past, I was working at IT support. I guess we all started some something or somewhere in that area, and then went over in the storage industry. Worked at EMC, worked at last at NetApp, and did some web development and sysadmin jobs in the meantime. So currently, I'm the senior storage architect for the company. Uh, so basically, everything which has to do with storage is is under my watch, and I do some Go pro uh, Go programming. You should too. And exploring new tech, exploring new features, things what we can benefit of, and I'm trying to get the most out of the systems and the technology which is evolving and try that if we can fit something into our um, to our work that can that we can benefit from. It. And of course, like the talk is is titled, I'm building bridges. So I'll try to I'm I'm not uh, I make a confession. I'm not the real developer guy. I'm more like the hobby developer. I would call it. So I do some coding, but I'm not the full-time coder like I guess most of you guys are. And for my future, yeah, world domination, of course. So what's this all about? Um, we faced some particular challenges in the storage area in our company where we had to manage about 20 plus clusters of storage. So um, I can tell you, so we're basically running all of our shared storage infrastructure uh, based out of NetApp storages. And they are divided up to clusters and consist out of several nodes. In our case, we have over 50 of them. Um, they are serving data out of 1,200 volumes. So we have 1,200 containers serving our data. And they are accessed by about 5,000, I don't know, 6,000 uh, servers. They are consuming that storage in some way. And they're consuming it over all over the different protocols. So you maybe are familiar with SIFs and FS and all the, the good stuff. And that results in a pretty large deal of, of traffic. So we have 100,000 IOPS, 4 gigabytes of traffic. And that's an average about of 24 hours. And we are managing currently about 1.25 petabyte of capacity. That's real data from our clients. And it's more or less rapidly, rapidly uh, growing. And the issues we are facing is um, basically the growth itself. As uh, as my, my colleague said, it's basically a good thing to have growth, but with growth comes the scale. And so we have to tackle that topic. Placement, mobility, provisioning, um, and balancing resources, these are all are really tied together. So we have to uh, for the provisioning part, for instance, if someone deploys in VM over the, the engine interface, we have most of the time we have the choices in, in, in most data centers to have more than one data store where we put the VM in. So we have to make decisions where's the, the best place to put it in, in terms of performance, in terms of scale, in terms of whatever metric you can imagine. Um, the same goes for mobility. So stuff moves around i mean it's the cloud you can have it here and tomorrow have it there or even in within hours you move your stuff around where you need the stuff you you, you take care and 
that's all the balancing of resources, of course, and that's all online. So hardware, re uh, hardware replacements, hardware life cycle is also a big topic because when a machine runs out of service, it gets old, it gets replaced by new hardware, we can't afford to bring the systems down. I mean, we all did that 10 years ago, but no one expects the system to go down anymore. Imagine what happens if, I don't know, storage of Facebook went down. How many people would jump off buildings? Yeah, really um, yeah and so our solution, we call it the Nexa Dynamic Storage Solution. And it consists mainly out of four parts. It's just a really high level overview what we did. So the first part is, of course, as we mentioned in the beginning, the NXE engine. So that's the interface to the world of storage, to my world. Um, with the engine, it's currently under development. It's not in production yet, so you won't see it if you, if you sign up to an account on the engine. Um, it's basically your interface, like the VM provisioning you saw, you can provision your storage as well. So you just choose how much data you want to access in which way, in which data center, and the rest is taken care of. To, you, to, to be able to do this, we are using Go as a programming language. Um, you will see it in the talk at 1 p.m. where you all are attending, I guess. It's, uh, it, the, the language has some great benefits for us. So a big deal of Go is the concurrency pattern, the concurrency, the built-in concurrency of the language. So we don't care about if we manage one cluster or we manage 50 clusters or even hundreds. We can all do it in parallel all the information we want to get, we get it right in time and we get it in parallel. We can do stuff at scale. That's, that's our, main feed, uh, our main focus. And, fr and from that resulted, as we call it, the AllSpark. So the fun fact, anyone can imagine what the AllSpark stands for? Just curious. Right. So all our storage systems are named after transformers, and all the nodes are based on transformers characters. So we would, we thought AllSpark would be the best the, the best fit because in transformers the AllSpark is this thing which gives life to the machines, and that's what we're aiming for. Um, yeah, and the AllSpark basically does all the work. I can show you then an example on on what we are doing with the AllSpark. Uh, and that thing connects one uh, for once the customers, and we also use it internally for our um, system operations guys. So currently, we're exploring the system operation part and to, to fine tune all that stuff before we release it into public. Um, basically, all the things that our system operations have done by tickets in regards to storage are now uh, handed over to the engine part, so they can just click in the GUI and stuff happens magically in the background. So for instance, if you imagine, as I said, data mobility, um, I think there is no need for every operations guy to be a storage expert. You, don't have, you shouldn't have to learn the internal workings of the storage system uh, to make a, well, uh, a, a good decision if you move something from point A to B. Just, it just should happen. You, have, you, you shouldn't have to take care about it. And that's what this thing does. And that's what we are releasing for the customer. As I said, fine tune it. And um, hopefully, rather soon than later, we will release it to the public. Um, to give you an overview how this thing works and where all those pieces fit together, is you can imagine anything that's really, really high level overview. Um, let's take the example, Michael, I guess, noted, uh, noted it. We have, did you talk about the topic about the hot and warm nodes? I guess not. Okay, <laughs> so in the cloud log and in the, in the solution we are providing in Elasticsearch, you have several types of nodes. So there are hot nodes, warm nodes, and if you, the data you're frequently accessing, the, the thing that you care about and you want to have in more or less real time, you put on hot nodes. So they're backed by local SSDs or, um, NVMem, RAM, uh, NVRAM, memory, whatever, just blazing fast nodes. And the thing you want to keep for archiving, you put on so-called warm nodes. These are nodes that can have local disks like SATA, like cheap stuff and capacity stuff, or you put it on shared storage as well. So you can connect NFS um, volumes coming from, as I said, our storage. 
So what Michael can do internally is if he wants to have uh, his warm nodes expanded or upgraded or introduce new ones, he can request new NFS uh, mount points for his nodes. So he sends the request to the AllSpark, the AllSpark, and that's not only one instance. So we are running multiple instances because in the microservice architecture, we can spin up lots of them. And we use it for, uh, for once for the fault tolerance. So we have cell running if one crashes. We don't care, we have some backup ones. And we also can do seamless upgrading because we can't afford to go offline. So we are running multiple instances. We take one offline, upgrade it, spin it up, and do a rolling upgrade that way. So he sends the request via the engine to the AllSpark. And what the AllSpark does is we lock stuff in cloud log. Um, and when that is done, the AllSpark sends the request to the storage system. Uh, the, the storage system, the, the business logic is contained in the AllSpark and it does its way and it knows about the internal workings of the storage stuff and provision, provisions the, the NFS mount point, returns the information, again, we log it. And after the log, we will present the information back to Michael. And what he sees on the screen is just basically a mount point. So he, he, he requests an NFS mount in a particular location with a particular size, and the result of that call is he will get a string telling me um, to, that he can copy paste in the, in the uh, FS tab file from his host, where he just have the IP address and the password he has to mount to. That's all. So he doesn't need to know anything about the internal workings of all that stuff. Uh, just to make a simple storage container. I mean, be serious, who wants to know all that stuff? And what we also use CloudLog for, or what I abuse CloudLog for is, I'm using it for collecting performance information because um, I can visualize it in Grafana, that's fine for me because I have some pretty lines to, show, to, to, to look at and take care of my system. But what I'm interested in, the, the AllSpark needs some way to decide where, what, res, what resource is, um, is how much loaded. So to, to make my decision on where I place stuff. Because as it's a warm node and it's more for archiving data, it should return in some time. It shouldn't be that slow that it never returns. So what I'm doing is I'm periodically pulling performance data from the storage systems and putting it into CloudLog. So it's not a logging event. It's, for me, it's um, performance data that I care about. I'll put it into the, to the cloud log solution. And with those processors, I can aggregate stuff. For instance, um, the disk pool. So I bundle up a bunch of physical hard drives into one big pool. I care about the performance of the pool rather than the single hard drive. So what I do is with this aggregation stuff, I can aggregate all the disks from one pool and get one line of uh, output for the whole pool and not for the single disk. And I don't have to repeat that the combination of, of the data of all the disks over and over and over again. CloudLog take, cloud, cloud takes care for me about that. So that's, that's a great feature what I'm using. And it's not for the logging, it's for me for performance data. So you can think out of the box um, what you can do with CloudLog as well. It says logging, but it can do much more than that. Um, that that's, that's a little bit of the overview of what, what this thing does. Um, the lessons that we learned for that, uh, of that thing is, um, we, we noticed you should choose the right tool for the job, obviously. In our case, we chose Go and the distributed microservice architecture. As I said, Go, because of its concurrency, and it's, it's developed for the web world for the WWD world, and the distributed microservice uh, architecture is stated for doing rolling upgrades, having fault tolerances, and stuff like that. And as we're working on a container solution, this thing is stateless, so it runs in containers quite well. Um, as well as we are levering existing tools, so as I said, the engine is the interface to the to this whole pretty storage world. Um, and the cloud log is used for, of course, logging. But in my case, I push performance data in it, and I can get much more out of it and don't have to deal with persisting those in, this information. As I said, I'm using a stateless container. 
I don't want to persist the data. I have CloudLock for that. And I consume it as a service as well, like any customer would. But when, when I started this project, I had two questions that Michael was, how do I get access and how much can I how much can I push per second? What's your limits? And then I was ready to go. I don't I don't care about it. Michael takes care of it. Um, and then the, the third part is um, the vendor logging stuff. Maybe you want it, maybe you don't. So there are pros and cons to both sides. Um, we are currently by choice vendor locked. Um, we we specifically chose one vendor to do all that stuff, in our case, NetApp, because we want to benefit from all the features this, this company can provide us and, and for all the benefits they can provide us. We could go in multi-vendor if we want to, and that's the beauty of Go as well, so the first, first point comes into place. Um, with the interface, with the interface um, methodology of Go, where I can define interfaces to interact with, with different search, in my case, with different search vendors, I can take all the search vendors and narrow it down to the features which they have in common, define interfaces, and can provide all of that out of one uh, unified binary and can connect to any backend I like. So that's why we chose, we chose the language. And as I said, vendor lock can be good, can be bad. It, it depends on what your, what your requirements are. And my favorite part, the fourth part, let others do the work. So I, I'm, I'm coming from a system operations side of, side of things, so I really don't like working so that much. I, I'd rather autom automate stuff so that other people can, can do what they like, and I don't have to take care about it. And that's why we automate all that stuff.